Just wanted to get everyone's interest jogged this morning with the case of a cervical spine trauma. Pull it up here. So this is a 27-year-old male with no past medical history that presents with progressively worsening axial neck pain seven weeks after a shallow diving injury. He had no motor weakness, paresthesia, or bowel or bladder dysfunction, and he was uh, neuro-intact, five out of five you know, muscle groups. Here we have a sagittal CT um, in the midline. He's got greater than 50% vertebral body height loss. Um, you can see here just by the morphology of the anterior column that this is an axial loading with flexion distraction injury mechanism, which makes sense with the shallow diving injury. And we see disruption of the superior end plate, inferior end plate, and the posterior wall, as well as quite significant inner spinous widening. This is suggestive of likely posterior tension band disruption. He also has a right pedicle fracture with extension into the lateral mass. Um, overall, when we're looking at the three-column model, we have a, a three-column injury, which is um, obviously quite unstable. Um, also had a left laminar fracture. MRI showed um, a pretty tight canal. Uh, this uh, gentleman had congenital stenosis with a canal diameter of 14 millimeters and three to four levels of uh, central stenosis. Interestingly enough, his MRI stir image did not show any signal change in the posterior tension band. However, this was um, likely due to the fact that this is seven weeks post-injury and most of the edema in the uh, posterior ligamentous complex most, most likely resolved. So um, for our algorithm for these patients that presents with cervical trauma, obviously um, the first step is diagnosis. And um, using the AO spine classification system, we can see here that um, you know, we're looking at either anterior column, a posterior column with a tension band injury, or a complete dislocation. For this specific case, we do have a posterior tension band injury. Um, however, it's mostly ligamentous. So this would be a type B2 injury with a flexion distraction injury mechanism with a disruption of the posterior tension band and a, a concomitant uh, vertebral body injury. So this is um, you know, a nationwide classification system that we use. However, we obviously use other ways to um, evaluate these injury, injury types. We also have the SLIC score. So when um, attempting to evaluate these patients for operative care, we can, use this, um, we can use this scoring system. And for this, we look at morphology, the discoligamentous complex, and neurologic status. This gentleman, he had a distraction morphology for his injury subtype. That's three points. Uh, his posterior ligamentous complex, we would most likely consider it disrupted. I think that some people might score that indeterminate given his MRI, but given the significant widening of the inner spinous space, I think we scored that as a two. And then he's obviously intact, so he gets zero points for his neurologic status. So overall, this is six points, and usually that would require um, operative care. So. When assessing these patients, obviously the next point is you know you want to you want to know exactly what you want to do. So either anterior, posterior, or a combined approach. And interestingly enough, the jury's still out in terms of the evidence in the literature that uh, that has been published. Um, just with a quick literature review, a couple of the um, largest series that I found was this is a study in Asian Spine Journal. It had uh, 24 patients, and these patients were managed with front back uh, procedures. They had all had one year follow up and there was no cases of non-union with them, um, and all patients had significant neurologic improvement. Um, this, is, this one was a series of 21 patients, also out of the um, Asian Spine Journal with uh, one year follow-up of anterior only approach. Uh, this series did have one case requiring posterior stabilization for instability and non-union, but otherwise uh, significant improvements in focal kyphosis, VAS score, as well as ODI. And then finally, um, we do have a series um, uh, out of a Harbor View with Dr. Chapman with 52 patients where this was a little bit more of a heterogeneous group, but they assessed and compared basically the anterior um, directly versus the uh, posterior approach, and they found two cases of non-union with the anterior cohort and uh, one no cases of non-union with the posterior cohort. So obviously, um, there's a multitude of op uh, op operative treatment strategies for these patients, and um, it is somewhat the dealer's choice and kind of um, dependent on the patient's exam as well as his radiographic findings. Um, at our institution, for this young gentleman, we did a two-stage procedure. We did a C6, C6 corpectomy and C5 to 7 anterior Fusion, and then we did we did proceed with uh, posterior stabilization in the form of a, a C4 to T2 uh, posterior fusion. This gentleman did very very well, and um, he had uh, complete union of his um, of his uh, fracture and did quite well in the long term.
So Rod, this is your case. Yeah. Nice presentation, Ravi. Um, so you did a lot of hardware in there. Uh, why so much? Why front and back? So uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, what's interesting about, go back to the original CT scan, um, is that I think for me, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to go anterior only. And um, uh, the kid was like two months after the injury. And which, what was shocking is he was getting chiropractic manipulation and um, didn't really, and, at, and even on the plain x-rays at the chiropractor, you could hardly see the fracture. And over the last uh, six weeks, you could see that there was more and more, um, even on the lateral x-rays, you can see there was a little bit more of a widening and gap um, in the posterior elements. And when we went in anteriorly, um, you know, I just didn't feel good about the fixation. And um, if you look at the axial images, I mean, this was a pretty significant injury that this kid had. Um, and even though we put in bicortical screws, you know, and it was one of these kids where I just didn't really trust him. You know, um, he was kind of squirrely. Like when I would go in his room, he wouldn't be wearing his collar. And so this was a very, in fact, we discussed this during spine conference here at Swedish. Um, you know, it was one of those, you hate to go posteriorly, but given the degree of injury and how, how much disruption there was posteriorly, um, I decided to go in from the back as well. I'm Great. curious to see what um, Eric Heyman thinks about this and John France. So Eric, you go first. Welcome, uh, Eric from Tampa, Florida. Uh, this is a little bit too aggressive for you. What would you do in Tampa? Can't hear Eric right now. We'll go to John. I saw him on the screen. Good morning, John, again. Uh, we lost you there for a second. This is a front and back thing, and Rod said that the patient was a bit squirrely. I, I know you have no squirrely patients in West Virginia, but uh, what are your thoughts? Is this just total overkill, or is, is bulletproof just the right answer here? Can't hear you right now. You have to unmute yourself. Wow. John. He's, you know, in the beginning, if I see that fracture pattern, that's getting fixation for me. I think most of these injuries are a front back issue for me. There are, I think there are some you can treat from the front, but you got to really protect him in a collar. My, my question is if he's two months out and do you have an upright film, is his alignment worse? I mean, would it have been possible to leave him alone? I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of not worn a collar and walked around for two months. Um, you know, could we have seen how he did over time? I mean, obviously, if he progresses into more kyphosis, a correction becomes a bigger surgery. But I'm wondering at two months, I mean, what, what made you decide you had to do something at this point? The fracture pattern, I, I'm surprised he got away with it as well as he did. I thought he would be doing way worse at two months. But what, what made you decide you had to do something? He really couldn't mobilize. Um, and uh, he was basically bed bound. Um, and... Uh, it was like after one of the manipulations, you could actually see on the on the x-rays that his alignment was, he was starting to actually, um, his alignment was getting worse and he was getting more and more um, uh, compression of that fracture anteriorly. So the pain was getting worse? Yeah. I mean, the, the, what was interesting is that um, he actually, the person that got him in was his chiropractor and girlfriend. Yeah. So he so really I did. might have, you know, at two months, in the beginning, this would have been a front and back for me. At two months, you know, you I see you went by cortically with the screws, so you, you got really good purchase up front. I might have put him in a collar and then followed him very closely with upright films, kind of weekly for a couple weeks with a plan to go to the back if, if I saw anything suspicious. But I think at two months, you know, I, I may have tried to get away with something from the, from, you know, he's pretty good position. So he didn't have to do much kyphotic and I had to pull him back. I would have done him front and back. But if the alignment was good in that CT, I, I might have watched him particularly with bicortical screws. I mean, you probably have great purchase in the front, I would suspect. 
Great. So great fodder for discussion right there. We showed one case in the beginning where we uh, had no treatment done and the patient is in misery now in a life-setting situation. The other one where a very decisive treatment was done and that's again one of the points of this uh, uh, meeting and that is having very clear um, uh, assessment protocols and a better understanding of when to act decisively and when to wait and see. Thank you, Ravi.